Bazalwani, well, in the mighty name of Jesus, my name is Tandi Mureng, um, and I am here to do offering. Uh, I would like to thank Umfundisi, Umamfundisi, and the leadership of the church for um, giving me this opportunity to share on offering um, this morning. Um, can we just bow our heads and pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for um, being a good God to us. Thank you, Lord God Almighty, that this is a new day um, that you have given us. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for the opportunity, O oh God, again to remind us about offering and to um, have the opportunity to offer as well, Lord God, to participate in the kingdom, Lord God Almighty. Um, and we thank you, Lord God Almighty, that you are God who gives us the seed Lord God, to plant in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that your word as it goes into our hearts, O oh God, may it minister, Lord God Almighty, may it remind us of what your promises are on your word, Lord God, regarding offering. I pray that you touch each and every one of us in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Today, um, I have titled my message, uh, Don't Let the Wind Distract You. Um, we continuously remind each other about the promises of God, uh, what the word says about our daily lives, because offering is one of those things that um, is our daily life. It should not be a, an event. Um, it should be something that we practice on a daily basis. In the, the, the account of the, the church, the details of um, where you can uh, transfer your offering will be flighted on the screen, if you can just take note of that. My scripture is from uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, I mean chapter 11, verse 4 and verse 6. I'm going to read uh, two versions on chapter 4 and uh, one on chapter 6. Let's just start there. If you wait until the wind and weather are just right, you will never say, you will never sow anything, never harvest anything. That's in Good News Version. In NLT it says, farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. And then we jump to verse 6. I'm going to uh, read it in GNB. It says, do, do your sowing in the morning and in the evening, evening too. You never know whether it will, it will all grow well or whether one sowing will do better than the other. The Bible says here that if, as a farmer, you look at the wind, you look at the weather, whether the weather is uh, good for you to sow, when it's the season to plant. Because in life we know that there's a season to plant and there's a season to harvest. When it is, it is a season to plant and you are concentrating on the weather, which is something that you will not be able to, to control, it becomes a destruction because you find yourself wanting to gauge uh, yes, I know it's the season to plant, but should I be planting now? Because you are looking at the weather. If you wait until the wind uh, and the weather are just right, you'll never sow anything and never harvest anything. 
we have a lot of wind in our lives. We have a lot of uh, weathers that are beyond our control. I normally look at, uh, you know, that in life as people, we, we celebrate, we get excited when it's harvest time because people are reaping the benefits of the hard work that has gone into sowing, you know. But when it's sowing time, in most cases, a lot of people don't say anything. You don't, you don't uh, make noise when, we, when you are sowing because it's a lot of work. People keep their heads down. I mean, we, we, if you think about when somebody is graduating, it's a motivation for others that are watching because you are thinking, yo, I must also get my act together. I must go and register and study. When you see someone celebrating 20 years uh, uh, in marriage, you're thinking, yo, I must work on my relationships, you know, or I must, I, must, I must do better. I want to get to those years because you're seeing the harvesting. But when, we, when it's time to plant, in most cases, because everybody has got their head down, everybody is working when it's planting time, when it's sowing time, nobody makes noise. So if you look at the wind, if you look at the weather, when it's time to plant, you're not going to harvest. Watch the seasons rather than looking at the current situation. If you look, um, if you think about what is going on in our lives right now, there's a lot of winds that are going uh, on. There's a lot of uh, weather that we don't understand that's going on. You know, uh, people lose their jobs. Um, Money seems like it, it, it is just not enough to actually take us through this season, you know. Uh, and it becomes difficult to offer. You're probably thinking, I will offer when I have enough. When they've cut my salary, there's no way I can offer. Those are the first easy things that we cut from our budget, you know. There's no way I can offer when I don't have a, a job Every little money that I get goes to other things that we think are, are more important. But the word of God says that, uh, that whether the wind, it doesn't matter what, which, which side the wind is blowing, it doesn't matter how the weather looks like. When it's a season to plant, seize that moment. Realize that moment that it is the season to plant. God help me that I plant in due season. You know, the good thing about the Bible, it says that he's the one who gives us the seed and he's the one who makes sure that the seed grows. But the responsibility of planting is on you. The responsibility of making sure that when it's your season to plant, it is on you. When you read Second um, Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to, to 15, I'm going to read it quickly. It says, remember that the person who sows few seeds will have a small crop. The one who sows many seeds will have a large crop. You should each give them as, as you have decided, not with regret or as of a sense of duty. For God loves the one who gives gladly. And God is able to give you more than you need so that you will always have all you need for yourself and more than enough for every good cause. As the scripture says, he gives generously to the needy. His kindness lasts for forever. And God who supplies seed to sow and bread to eat will also supply you with all the seed you need and will make it grow and produce a rich harvest from your generosity. He will always make you rich enough to be generous at all times, so that many will thank God for your gifts, which they receive from us. For this service you perform not only you perform not only meets the needs of God's people, but also produces an outpouring of gratitude to God. And because of the proof which this service of yours brings, many will give glory to God for, for your loyalty to the gospel of Christ, which you profess, and for, the, for your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. And so with deep 
affection, they will pray for you because of the extraordinary grace God has shown you. Let us thank God for this priceless gift. The Bible just reminds us here that we have a God who gives us the seed. That in times of, of sowing, that you are able to plow. And I like the, the, what the Bible says because it reminds us that God will not just give us enough for us. He'll give us enough that we, we have enough for ourselves and to put a seed in the ground. To bless other people. Because when we have done that, glory and honor goes to him. This morning, I just want to challenge you, uh, child of God, that the seed that you are holding, God has given you for, time, for a time like this. Yes, the weather might not be conducive for this season, or you, you might think that, you know, it's not going to rain, or it, it, it just doesn't seem conducive. But God has given you a seed, and this is your opportunity to plant a seed. Because remember, if you do not plant, you will not be able to harvest. Then the amount of seed that you plant will determine the harvest that you get. You know, um, the scripture says in, in Ecclesiastes says that scatter your seed. You don't know that when God makes it... Uh, multiplies it, how much will come out? Scatter your seed. The seed that is in your hand, it is for a season like this. Irrespective of whether, what, how the weather looks like, irrespective of where the wind is blowing, it is your opportunity to give this, this morning. Can we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we pray for the seeds that we are holding, oh God. We are putting them in the ground with faith, oh God Almighty. Even as we scattering them, oh God, as we are giving, Lord God Almighty, in church, Lord God Almighty, to people that are around us, Father God, I pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that Father God, may you bless each and every seed, oh God Almighty, that we are putting in the ground, Father God. May it multiply, oh God Almighty. May it bring glory to your name, Jehovah. Your, 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 your word says that, Lord God Almighty, when we perform that act of service, Lord God, people realize, Lord God Almighty, the love you have for them, oh God, because we are your hands, in the name of Jesus. I pray that, Lord God, through our giving, Father God, through our generosity, Father God, may people bring glory, honor, and praise unto your holy name. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Good morning, saints. My name is Monden Lovu, and I've been tasked to do scripture reading this morning. Our reading will come from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17, and I'll be reading from the AMPC version. It reads as follows. Now these Philistines gathered their armies for battle and were assembled at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Ezekiah in Ephesus' Demim. Saul and the men of Israel were encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. And a champion went out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and span almost ten feet. And he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of mail, and the coat weighed five thousand shekels of bronze. He had bronze shin armor on his legs and a bronze javelin across his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. His spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and a shield-bearer went before him. Goliath stood and shouted at the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servant. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, 
I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and gently afraid. David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem and in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. Jesse in the days of Saul was old, advanced in age. His three eldest sons had followed Saul into battle. Their names were Eliab, the firstborn, the next Abinadad, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. The Philistines came out morning and evening, presenting himself for 40 days. And Jesse said to, J to David his son, Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and ten loaves and carry them quickly to your brothers at the camp. Also, take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousands. See how your brothers fare, and bring some token from them. Now Saul and the brothers and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host going forth to the battleground shouted the battle cry. And Israel and the Philistines put the battle in array, army against army. David left his packages in the care of the baggage keeper and ran into the ranks and came and greeted his brothers. As they talked, behold, Goliath the champion, the Philistine of God, came forth from the Philistine ranks and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, terrified. And the Israelites said, Have you seen this man who has come out? Surely he has come out to defy Israel, and the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, and he will give his daughter and make his father's house free from taxes and service in Israel. And David said to the men standing by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistines and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistines that he should defy armies of the living God? And the men told him, Thus shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard what he had said to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why did you come here? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and evilness of heart, for you came down that you might see the battle. And David said, What have I done? Was it not a harmless question? And David turned away from Eliab to another, and he asked the same question, and again the man gave him the same answer. When David's words were heard, they were repeated to Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight with him. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go to fight against the Philistine. You are only an adolescent, and he has been a warrior from his youth. And David said to Saul, Your servant kept his father's sheep. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out of it and smote it and delivered the lamb out of his mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and smote it and killed it. Your servant killed both the lion and the bear, and the uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defiled the army of the living God. David said, The Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword over his armor. Then he tried to go, but he could not, for he was not used to it. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I am not used to them. And David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's lunchbox, a whole kid's skin slung from his shoulder, in his pouch, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David, the man who bore the shield going before him. And when the Philistine looked around and saw David, he scorned and despised him, for he was but an adolescent, a healthy reddish color of hair face. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you should come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds on the air and the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. 
But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the ranks of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will smite you and cut off your head, and I will give the corpses of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into your hands. When the Philistine came forward to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it, and it struck the Philistine, sinking into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck down the Philistine and slew him. But no sword was in David's hand. So he ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their mighty champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Garth and the gates of Ekron. So the wounded Philistines fell along the way from Sharim and as far as Garth and Ekron. The Israelites returned from the pursuit of the Philistines and plundered their tents. David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put up his armor in his tent. When Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I cannot tell. The king said, Inquire whose son the stripling is. When David returned from killing Goliath the, Philist the Philistine, Abner brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. And this is the word of the Lord.
morning, Barcelona, and uh, welcome to our Sunday morning service. And thank you for making time to join us in fellowship. And uh, I also want to welcome our first time visitors and our frequent visitors and say, we don't take it lightly. We don't take your visitation in this fellowship lightly and God bless you. I believe that God has a word for you this morning. Let us open in prayer in Jesus name. Father, we thank you and we bless you God this morning. We give you all the praise and all the honor. Thank you God for giving us the privilege to come and fellowship. And as we do that, Lord, we awake, we await with expectant hearts in the name of Jesus, we believe in your guidance and your blessings in Jesus' name. Use my lips, Lord, to convey your message in the name of Jesus. Amen. Saints, I want to start <clears throat> with uh, declarations based on Psalms 103, which are consistent with our uh, theme for the year, which is benefits of faith. Um, Psalms 103, verse 1 to 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. I believe and receive the Lord's daily forgiveness of my sins. I believe and receive the Lord's daily healing of my body, soul, and spirit. I believe and receive the Lord's daily redemption from the enemy's plans to steal from me, kill, and destroy my life. I believe and receive the Lord's daily crown of love, kindness, and mercy. I believe and receive the Lord's daily shower of blessings and favor over my life. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Amen. Make those declarations every day, believing that God, your faith, gives you benefits which come from God. Amen. This morning, saints, I want to teach on the subject uh, of God is the weapon for overcoming obstacles. God is the weapon for overcoming the obstacles. <clears throat> and we shall take our main scripture from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 from verse 4, 45 to 47. Verse 45 to 47. And I'm reading in the AMPC. It says, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the ranks of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will smite you and cut off your head. And I will give the corpses of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Amen. This scripture, saints, comes from the moment when David um, fought with Goliath. In fact, it wasn't much of a fight, ultimately. But Joseph, David had been sent by his father to actually take food to his brothers who were camped as part of the Israel, uh, Israelite army, and they were to fight against the Philistines. So he gets to the camp and he finds the, the, the Israeli army actually camped. And there was a menacing giant who came up every day, who came up to despise and insult the God of Israel. And David, because he was anointed as king and he had the spirit of God, was offended by what Goliath was doing. So he asked around and says, but who is this man who is parading around and actually insulting the God of heaven? Who is, this, who is this man? And they tell him, and then he says, but what is the man who is going to fight this particular giant? What will he get? And they told him what the prize was that he was going to get. As he was having that conversation, one of his brothers asked him, and says, what are you doing here? Because he's supposed to be looking after sheep. But he didn't know that David, was, uh, he, he, that David had an appointment on that day to fight this giant because he was appointed and anointed of God. So we find him here. He, before he could actually even go and fight Goliath, he is presented to the king. And he says, I am prepared to go and fight this giant. And the king says, well, you don't have any armor. You are not even a soldier. Uh, let me give you my kingly gowns to wear, and I'll give you my sword to go and fight this giant. 
And what does David say? David says, no, I, I can't wear these. These are too heavy for me. I will use what I know. I will use my relationship with God to go and fight the giant. So he is allowed to go and fight the giant. And this is where we find him. And as he is approaching Goliath, Goliath looks at him and says, what is this? In fact, if we can go to uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45. And I want us to take it early. In verse 41 it says, Meanwhile the Philistine, that is Goliath, with his shield bearer in front. He was, Goliath was not even carrying his own shield. There was a shield bearer in front of him. Kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy. A glowing, with, a glowing with health and handsome, and it despised him. So as David approaches Goliath, and Goliath is approaching, Goliath looks at him, and he says, and then Goliath says to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and to the wild animals. This is what Goliath says. He looks at Goliath, at David's stature. He looks at the fact that he's a young man. He looks fresh and healthy. He doesn't look like a soldier. And he's not actually carrying the normal weapons of war. Because Goliath, as a, as a soldier and as a warrior, he was used to recognizing and fighting others who are equally and similarly equipped as he was. So when he looked at David, he could see no usual armory, he could see no usual weapon, and he could see no regular soldier. What he could see was a boy. Remember, we're talking about God is the weapon for overcoming obstacles. And if you think back, the path of David, David was anointed to becoming a king and Goliath was one of the obstacles he had to deal with on his path to becoming a king. And how was David going to remove this obstacle? It's very clear that David was not approaching Goliath using the normal traditional or conventional means of fighting a giant and fighting a warrior who had defeated many other warriors. He was going to use a different way of dealing with Goliath. And now David doesn't make secret of how he was going to fight Goliath. And Goliath could not understand what David was saying. But David says to him in verse 45 to verse 7, you see, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. What David is saying is, you come to me with a, as if you're going to fight a conventional war. You come to me with conventional weapons. But look at what David says. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. I come to you with an unconventional weapon. I come to you in the name of the Lord. So David approached this fight with Goliath in the name of the Lord, not in the name of his confidence and experience, not in the name of the weapons he was carrying, and not in the name of his skills, and not in the name of his experience. There are times when saints, God places us, he calls us to do certain things and we are faced with obstacles which look like a conventional battle, which look like a conventional obstacle, but God requires us not to rely on our experience, not to rely on our training, not to rely on our confidence, not to rely even on the usual weapons, but to rely on him in the name of the Lord. Because our conventional weapons will be no match to what we are facing. You see, if David was carrying a normal sword, his sword was no match for a Goliath. You see, if David was approaching Goliath wearing the usual, the usual garments of war, he was no match with the Goliath. You see, Goliath was not even carrying his own weapons. Somebody else had to carry because he was a man who was properly equipped. So this was not a battle for David. It was a battle for God. And David recognized it as such. Some of us have no insight in relation to the obstacles we're facing. Some of us have got no insight in relation to the battles we're fighting. It may look like a normal battle. You, it may look like you're facing a normal enemy, but we are facing an enemy who requires God to fight for you. And you need to call it what it is and say, this is God's battle, it is not my battle. Particularly if you are undermatched for what you're facing. 
There are times, children of God, when we are faced with things for which we are absolutely ill-equipped. We are nothing in the face of the battle because we don't have it. But you have to call on God and say, this one is God's battle. It is an obstacle for God to deal with. And David recognized it as such. He says, I come in the name of the Lord. You see, David said, it was God who would deliver Goliath into his hands. He says that, he tells Goliath, he said, God will deliver you into my hands. He says, this is the day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will smite you and cut off your head. Here's the other thing. The God-inspired victory that David was talking about here would bring glory to God. So David says it's God's battle. It is God who will deliver Goliath to him. And the victory will not bring glory to David, but it will bring glory to who? To God. Note that he doesn't say the whole earth will know me. He says the whole earth will know God because this is God's battle. He is fighting it. God is the main weapon. And sometimes we know that it is God's battle, but we want to pronounce it as if it is our victory. How about returning the glory back to God and say, this thing looks so impossible. I don't know what obstacle you are facing. I don't know what battle you are facing, but you are ill-equipped and ill-matched for the battle. And if you call it what it is, that it is God's battle, you must return the glory to God when you overcome. And you must thank God for the victory before it even arrives because he is the one who is going to battle, not you. And David called it as such, and he praised God before he could even defeat Goliath. Because God is our weapon for obstacles. You see, David says towards the end of the scriptures, he says, for the battle is the Lord's. You are not fighting what David was saying to Goliath, and Goliath was not listening. He was saying, you're not fighting the boy that you can see. You're not fighting me. You are fighting God. There are times when we need to tell our enemies as we pray that you are not fighting me. I'm the apple of God. Are you fighting God? On this one, you have touched God because God has called me to this. God is going to do battle with you. You are facing God and declare it as such and say, Father, it is your battle to fight. It is not mine to fight. And whoever is fighting me and the obstacle here, it is God that is being fought. And let the enemy and the obstacle face the God of heaven. As we know what happened here, God, David did the most ridiculous thing. He pulled, he took a sling gun, he took a cup, one stone, and he swung the stone, and it hit and killed Goliath. How, how probable is this? A giant who was well armed, well covered, is killed by, through a slingshot and by one stone. And that shows you that the stone that David was picking up and the sling gun that uh, David was using, that was all God at work. Goliath was facing a God who fights unconventional weapons, who doesn't fight according to the strategies of men. He fights in accordance with his own plan because he is removing obstacles from the path of his anointed ones. And we've got to declare and call upon God to be active in our lives as the weapon for removing the obstacles. These obstacles may look physical, but there is a spiritual dimension to the obstacle that you're facing. You may be facing this obstacle in your family. You may be facing this obstacle in your career. You may be facing this obstacle in your business. You may be facing an obstacle, a giant in your spiritual life. You better call God as the weapon of your faith to remove and destroy such a weapon in the name of Jesus. You know, all of our lives' battles belong to God. They belong to God. We don't get involved in some fights. Instead, God fights these battles for us. As children of God, there are fights we don't need to get involved in. The things that you're anointed for, there are fights you don't have to get involved in. God does the fighting and removes the obstacles. It's not for us to fight, it is for God to fight. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15 and, and 17, it says this. And he said, listen, 
all of Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord, this is the prophet speaking. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. This battle, this obstacle is not yours, but it is God's battle. In verse 17 it says, you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves and stand still. See the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear pity or not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with you. He says, you will not lift a finger. God is going to fight. There are moments which call for you to call upon God and say, Father, this is a fight and a battle in my life. I am threatened. I can see no way out, but this is your battle. Father, I pray that you become the weapon that you are and Father, I will not lift a finger in this one. I have faith in you and you, God, are going to go before me. I declare it as your fight and I receive your success in this. God is the weapon for overcoming obstacles in our lives. Many people are battling many things since they've been fighting for things for such a long time. I pray that that obstacle which is standing between you and the health of your family, which was something that wants to tear your family, that you declare it as a war, against our God and let God go to battle. I declare that the obstacle which you are facing in the path of your business success succeeding, that you call upon God and say, this obstacle Father requires you. This is a fight for the Lord, not my fight. And I pray and have faith in God. I will lift no finger in this one except to stand my knees and believe in God. I have taken all the actions I can take. I have taken all the armor that I could take. But what I can see in front of me, I've got no answer. But I'm calling upon the God of heaven to fight and break, and, and, and break this obstacle. I will lift no finger because I believe in you, God. You are the God who fights and you are the weapon. Men may not see the weapon, but you, God, are the weapon. Amen. You see, there's something which we ought to know. We use powerful God weapons to clear every obstruction as children of God. We use every powerful God weapon to clear every obstruction. You see, the world system is very unfair. You see, the, world, the way things in the world work, they're very unfair. That's why as children of God, we've got to be armed. We've got to be a family that believes in the arms that God has given us. Our spiritual armory must be used. You see, we cannot be a weak family of believers. We must be a family of believers that uses the armory that God has given us. And we must use our God weapon, God-given weapons to fight battles. We must allow God to do that. Even in the face of unfairness in the world, we must fight unfairness using God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6 in the message says, <coughs> Excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6 in the message says, The world is unprincipled. The world is unprincipled. People who are, who are honest, people who do the right things, are always being pushed back to, to the back of the queue. People who are thieves, who are liars, are in the front of the queue. You see people who are thieves and liars who are taking from people who are principled. This is the way of the world. It's unfair. It's unprincipled. It's a dog eat dog out there. This is what the word says. It's a dog eat dog. The world doesn't fight fair. But we don't live or fight our battles that way as children of God. Never have and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing that entire massively corrupt culture. The weapon who is God is there to destroy that entirely corrupt culture in the world, which is unprincipled, which is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, which, which is unfair. We use the weapons of our faith. We don't join in to steal. We don't join in to be unfair. But we call upon God and say, Father, I see unfairness in this area. I pray that you destroy it in the name of Jesus and remove it. Father, I see oppression in this area. I call for you, God, to destroy it in the name of Jesus. Because that's the weapon of our faith. It's the reality of what we face in this world. 
We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fighting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. So this is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6 in the Message Bible. We fight unprincipled and unfairness in this world using the weapons of God. We call upon God to destroy. Whatever unfairness you have experienced in this world, use God as an instrument and a weapon to destroy the unfairness. Do not join them. Do not give up in the face of unfairness. You know what Christ told us in John 16 verse 33 says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. How about tapping into the power of the God who has overcome the world? Christ overcame unfairness. Christ overcame the dog eat dog type world. Christ overcame the unfairness of the the fights. We've seen a lot of unfairness in this world. Big men, powerful men, rich men dishing out unfairness on people. And we say we use the power of God to confront unfairness. It is not out of fashion to pray against unfairness. It is not out of fashion to pray against corruption. It is not out of fashion to pray against lying thieves. We must pray against it in the name of Jesus so that obstacles can be removed. These are the same people who stand against our opportunities. These are the same people who stand against development, who stand against the good life that people deserve. We must pray against that in the name of Jesus because the world is unfair and we don't fight unfairness with unfairness, but we fight with the power of God and the word of God, which is our instrument and weapon in the name of Jesus. We use God to fight against unfairness. You see, saints, we are to put on the armor of God, put on the armor of God and not remain in church. We don't put on the armor of God and sit in the pews. We put on the armor of God and use it. It's to be used in the war we are facing. It's not to be worn and then we sit and, and pat each other on the back. We use the armor of God against all the things that confront us, against all the obstacles that confront us. We wear the armor and use it. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 13 in the message it says, and that about wraps it up. God is strong and he wants you to be strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use. You will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws. You wear the full armor of God and put it to you. Stand against the things that the devil is perpetuating in this life. Stand against all the unfairness. Stand against all the obstacles that are confronting you, your family, your friends, your church, and other fellow believers and general human beings. Use that armor to stand against the devil. Use the armor. Don't just wear it as a badge of honor. It's for fighting. And we don't fight only in the spiritual realm, we fight in the physical realm. The world is waiting for Christians who stand up to unfairness. The world is waiting for believers who stand up and confront the troubles that the trouble men. Who use God. God is the weapon. Who wear the armor and use it. How dispiriting it is to see a soldier who is decorated wearing army fatigue and all he can do is sit down in the face of abuse. And what's the soldier for? The glory of the soldier is not in the uniform. The glory of the soldier is not in just carrying the weapon and standing. It is when the obstacles arise and you say we've got an army and it goes to battle. That's the glory. That's why people get medals of honor because they have used the weapons. You don't get a medal of honor by just enrolling. You get a medal of honor by enrolling, training, getting the weapons, and fighting and overcoming. That's why you, you, you get glory. We bring glory to God by using the weapons of our faith. And God is the weapon of our faith. We can't expect God to descend from heaven to come and do battle here when he's given us the weapons. When is in our hands? When is in our prayers? When is in our words? When is in our minds? When is in everything that we do? God is in us. He will use us mightily. But we've got to allow him to enable us to use the weapons. Goes on to say, this is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. 
This is for keeps. The weapons are for keeps. A life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You are up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get. Every weapon God has issued so that when it's all over but they're shouting, you will still be on your feet. When the battle is over and the battle rages on until we die, you will still be on your feet. You see, we must be like Jesus. Even when he went up to heaven, after he died, he was on his feet because he conquered. Even those apostles who were, who, who, who were nailed to the cross upside down, they died still on their feet, professing the name of Jesus. Even when Stephen was stoned to death, he was still on his feet, even though he was kneeling. You know what feet he was standing on? The weapons that God had given him. We are called upon to fight the battles of our time. To use the weapon that God has given us, it is the battles of our time. The battle of hunger, we fight it in our time. The battle of destitution, we fight it in our time. The battle of abuse, we fight it in our time. We fight it using the weapons that God has given us. God has called Christians to use the weapons. This is not time for a sleeping church. This is not time for a church that is given up. This is not time for a church that is flat. This is not time for an army of Christians that is disorganized, not knowing who has called them, not knowing who the Father is, not knowing who arms the church. This is not a time for a church that walks around helpless, putting its head on the head. You are a powerful child of God with a powerful child, with a powerful weapon. Be like David when you approach Goliath. Do not be looking at what he is wearing. You must be looking at the God who is in your bag, the God who is in the stone, the God who is in the slinger, and you shoot to kill. That's the power that we have. It's not measured by how you look. It's not measured by the earthly things that you are. It's measured by the spiritual power that you have. We pray for an awakening. God says the awakening is here. The revival is here. The weapons are here. What more are you looking for? What more are you looking for? Because I am the weapon. I'm the weapon. Amen. When God is anointed and called you for anything, he becomes the weapon of your faith. When God has called you and has anointed you, he becomes the weapon for you to overcome and get to the end. Whatever God has called you to do, when God has placed in your hands, he becomes the weapon by which you remove obstacles in the path of whatever it is that stands against you in what God has called you to do. You see, if you want to see, when God has anointed you for the task in this life, he becomes your weapon. When God is your weapon, whatever looks ordinary or weak will be transformed to outperform the obstacles. You see, when, when God is in, is in you, when God is in your life and is in your weapon, he transforms your ability. When people look at you, they'll not see the transformation that has happened in time. It is for you to step out in faith. You may still look the same, but in the spiritual realm, God is moving. In the spiritual realm, God is arming you. In the spiritual realm, God is giving you the power to break down the obstacles. You see, people may look at you through a human eyes and not realize that God is moving through you and not realize that God is at work in you and not realize that what, what is about to hit them is a powerful thing because God is in you and is working through you. You see, saints, you can look at Moses. Moses, when, when he went to Egypt, Pharaoh calls other prophets and he says, throw down your snakes. They didn't know that the Moses they're confronting this time around was not the fugitive from justice. It is a Moses that had seen God. And when he, Aaron threw down the snake, it gobbled up all the other snakes because he was armed to remove the obstacle that was Pharaoh. You see, saints, there are many other people in the Bible. When Joseph was called by Pharaoh to interpret dreams, dreams that others had not been able to, to interpret, they thought they were calling a prisoner, but they didn't realize that they were calling someone who was anointed of God to interpret dreams. He interpreted the dream and brought about solutions. You see, when... when um, when Daniel was called to interpret the, 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 the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, they didn't know that he had been armed to tell what the dream was and to answer because he had been armed by God. So God can equip you even for extraordinary situations when other people think you're ordinary. What comes out of your mouth, what comes out of your mind, what comes out of your head, what comes out, everything you do is inspired by God to remove obstacles. Well, how dare you look at yourself and think you're weak in the name of Jesus? How dare you look look down upon yourself when the God in you is the creator of heaven and earth who can see far beyond what you can see. 
Amen. You see, God is our offensive and defensive weapon. Most of us rely on God for defense. We don't rely on God for offense. Some of us have not taken the offensive step to use God as the weapon, as an offensive weapon. You know, every country has got a defensive and an offensive strategy. If you, defend, if you only depend on a defensive strategy, people will run you over. There are times when you've got to go into enemy territory to confront without fear. And God is our offensive and defensive weapon. You see in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, it says, What then shall we say to these things? Listen to this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Someone who is offensive and moves with God by faith will do this when it becomes offensive. And say, if God is for me, who can stand against me? I'm breaking the obstacle. That's an offensive approach to using the weapon that God is. There's a defensive step. Isaiah 54 verse 17, it says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. That's a defensive stance of God. You see, when you pray Psalms 91, don't pray Psalms 91 only as a protective thing. Also use it as an offensive weapon and say, my God says a thousand may fall around me, but I shall not see it. When God, God is our weapon to remove obstacles. Amen. So when God is your weapon, you'll acquire supernatural confidence. You see that confidence that David had when Saul said, take this. You know what David had? Because God was his weapon, he said, I don't need your clothes. I don't need your sword. I will use what God has given me. My God is going to war. When God is your weapon, you'll have supernatural confidence, which you don't take from your education, you don't take from your experience, you don't take from your equipment, you take from God. You will have supernatural confidence as a child of God. When God is your weapon, you will not require a man-made shield or armory. When God is your weapon, you will not be borrowing skills, ideas, tactics from people. You will not need that. You will only take from God. When God is, is, is your weapon, you will not require man-made ideas. When God is your weapon, your enemies and your opponents and the obstacles will not see you coming. They would think they are seeing a small, handsome boy who doesn't look like a, a soldier, who is ill-equipped. But they'll not see the God in the man. They'll not see the God in the woman. They'll not see the God in the adult. They'll not see the God who is in the youth or young person. They will not see you coming when, you are, when God is your weapon. You see, when God is your weapon, you'll not have to shoot twice, three times, four times. You'll shoot only once by faith, and God will go into action. You see, don't number the moment God takes to defeat in years or days or hours. Number it in the moment God decides to act. And you'll act only once and remove the obstacle. You won't have to swing the sling gun several times. you swing by faith and say, God, you take it, I leave it in your hands. When God is your weapon, you'll never miss the target. When God is your weapon, you'll never miss the target. You say, Father, there is a menacing Goliath in this town. There is a menacing Goliath in this valley. And Father, this particular stone is meant for that head. And Father, go to work. When God is your weapon, you won't miss the target. You see, when God is your weapon, you'll bring down a feared giant. When God is your weapon, you bring down a fear. The fact that someone else has failed because of Goliath, the fact that Goliath has killed other people, when God is your weapon, it doesn't mean that you will fail. Your God will bring down a fear child. If other people have been brought down by certain things before, you will not get stuck in the same place in the name of Jesus. You will swing because God is your weapon. He'll bring down a fear giant. When God is your weapon, you see God brings down kings and bestows kings. You see, on that day, you know the other person was dethroned by David, was Saul. 
God brought down so. And on that day, when David was done, when God was done, he elevated David as a king. It may have taken time for him to assume the position, but that's the day everybody else saw that the man who's supposed to occupy the throne is this guy here. You see, when God is your weapon, he destroys kings. He will elevate you and remove certain people to not deserve to be in certain positions because they have obtained such positions through evil means. When God is your weapon, he has deadly consequences. Someone is going to die when God goes to war. And someone is going to leave. Now the person who's going to leave is the user of God. The person who's going to die is the obstacle who is standing in the way of the things that God wants to do. You may not, the person may not die a physical death, but he will be defeated. Something will die and it will definitely not, the pers- not be the person who is using God as the weapon. This morning, saints, it's a moment of revival. It's to strengthen the knees of people who are dying is to strengthen the knees of people who are facing difficult obstacles. And this morning I want to pray for somebody who is saying, Father, I want to use you as my weapon in the name of Jesus. You can never use this weapon unless you know God, unless you believe God with your heart and confess that he is Lord and Savior over your life. You cannot use this weapon. You need to know him first. And this morning I want to invite somebody who says, I want to know this powerful weapon in my life so that I can deal with these obstacles which have been staring me in the face I've not made progress, not one progress, not one step because of this thing. I want to defeat in the name of Jesus and I want God to go into. If you say, I want to accept the Lord as my personal Savior, I want to pray with you this morning. Follow me as I pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you. I believe with my heart and confess with my mouth that I am a sinner and I want to accept you as my Lord and personal Savior. I believe that you died on the cross and rose on the third day and that you're sitting in the right hand of God, and that today I'm your child. I'll tell my friends and family that I know this God who is a weapon He's going to fight for me today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, you're a child of God today. You have all the right to believe and trust God to be the weapon in your life to deal with the obstacles that you face. Then I want to pray for all of our saints and pray that God will revive us and bring it up again that he is the weapon of our lives that we shall be victorious as we trust him. We shall break all obstacles. I want to pray for all of us this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are facing different obstacles. We live in a world that is unfair. We live in a world that is corrupt. But Father, we call upon your name this morning that you shall be the weapon of our lives. I don't know what obstacles your children are facing. Even if they are facing obstacles in their families. They are facing obstacles in their finances, they are facing obstacles in their health, they are facing obstacles in their careers, they are facing all manner of obstacles. We pray that God, you will go to war for them. May we have faith in you that God, you are our weapon. Like David, let's declare that this is battle is not ours, it is yours, Jesus. And we shall wait, expect, and believing for a breakthrough in the name of Jesus. And your name will be glorified because you would have gone to battle for us. We receive victory this morning. We receive your power this morning. We receive that you are the man of war. We receive that we have totally surrendered to you in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for those who are doubting this morning that you shall awaken the belief and faith in you. You shall restore their confidence in you. You shall restore the fact that you are the God who goes to war for your children. And Father, we pray for the turnaround in Jesus' name. Everybody has been believing for a turnaround, Father. I pray that they shall believe in you this morning. They shall believe in your power. In the mighty name of Jesus, you are uprooting all sorts of obstacles. We believe in that this morning. We declare victory in the name of Jesus. You are the God of David. You are the God of Joseph. You are the God of Abraham. You are the God of Moses. You shift and you change things and you uproot things by the power of the Holy Ghost. And we receive it this morning. Thank you, God, for the victory. Thank you, God, for being a weapon of our faith and of our lives. May the grace of God and the love of Jesus and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with all of us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.